Lord be with you. You may find more historically accurate uh, nativities in display in other churches, but I don't think you find a better one than the one that we have. So, uh, Let's look at Matthew chapter 24. I invite you to turn with me there this morning. Matthew chapter 24, we'll be reading verses 36 through 44 there. And if the power goes out, I'm going to keep preaching. So, I mean, don't get any ideas about flipping breakers. Matthew chapter 24, beginning with verse 36, reading through verse 44. But about that day and hour, no one knows, neither the angels of heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. For as the days of Noah were, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day Noah entered the ark, and they knew nothing until the flood came and swept them all away, so too will be the coming of the Son of Man. Then two will be in the field, one will be taken and one will be left. Two women will be grinding meal together, one will be taken and one will be left. Keep awake, therefore, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore, you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an unexpected hour. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? Again, God, we are thankful for this day. We're thankful for this time now when we come to hear a word from you from Holy Scripture. A word about hope and anticipation. As we look forward all the more now to your coming into this world, into our lives, to turn us right side up and to call us home. So, Lord, speak to us now. May your Holy Spirit stir in our presence, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. First Sunday of Advent is traditionally the Sunday of hope. And hope is a wonderful thing. Hope can push us on, though life may be tumultuous and depressing. It allows us to live in the present while longing for a better, fuller future hope calls our hearts and our minds forward, giving us motivation to to change the present, to bring about that brighter and fuller future. But then again, sometimes hope can, can be a sticky thing, a dangerous thing. It can keep us stuck, stuck in a rut, unwilling to accept the inevitable so we can deal with what's here and now. It lets the ideal, the perfect, linger in the midst of a world that's anything but ideal or perfect. It keeps us frozen sometimes, unwilling to move forward with healing and progress because we hope, we hope things will be like they used to be. We hope things will be the way we want them. We hope it'll all just go away. It's a double-edged sword. It can cut quick of joy, or saw right through to the marrow of depression. It's that same double-edged sword that can cut away an entire nation, can cut away at an entire nation for centuries, helping them to persevere through defeat and devastation, but also holding them on to something. By the time Matthew penned his gospel, Israel had a history laced with this sort of tragedy and despair and hope. They had once been called the chosen people of God, blessed by the calling of Abraham, delivered from the bondage of Egypt, only to cycle through these epochs of devotion, rejection, judgment, disaster, devotion, rejection, judgment, disaster. The Israel that Matthew knew had been ruled and oppressed by all sorts of nations, from Egypt to Syria, Babylon, Persia, Greece, and now squarely under the thumb of the Caesar of Rome. And aside from the emperor's tyrannical display of power with the destruction of the temple in 70 A.D., this was the same Israel that Jesus knew. 
a nation clinging to the sharp edges of hope. They began clinging to that hope sometime after the Babylonian deportation around the year 586 B.C. That's when Israel became this nation defined by hope, hope in a new deliverer. Before this time, Messiah was just a word that meant anointed, one chosen by God to do anything from, from do your taxes to, to deliver the nation as a Persian king. But now, this word meant something else. It meant someone who was coming to be the vengeance of God, the anointed one, the Messiah, the one who was going to restore Israel. And so by the time of the first century, Messianic hopes were so high that one could find a Messiah on just about every corner. The British comedy troupe Monty Python talks about this a little bit in a sort of tongue-in-cheek way in their movie The Life of Brian. In that film, a little baby named Brian, just a regular kid, is born just a couple of stables down from where Jesus is born. And people confuse him for the rest of his life as the Messiah. And while they're rather loose with the morals and historical accuracy of first century Jewish messianic claims, all the while I think being completely honest and fair and respectful to Jesus, the boys from Monty Python aren't too far from the mark. Messiahs popped up everywhere. People claimed to be messiahs all the time, leading groups, leading militias all the time. You don't have to look too far in the records of Flavius Josephus, that first century Roman Jewish historian, to see those stories of so-called messiahs. But Jesus of Nazareth was different. With Jesus, the hopes of Israel seemed to be sort of materializing before their eyes. Matthew even includes, only Matthew, this story of these magi, these, these wise men, we call them, coming to worship him as the king after his birth. And then, then we're right away in the thick of it. He's performing miracles as an adult, healing the sick, claiming the authority to forgive sins and interpret the law. This Jesus, for so many, was surely the longed hoped for Messiah. Matthew even records some of his most beautiful words as he stood on top of this mount on this hill and proclaimed the coming kingdom of heaven in the Sermon on the Mount. Israel's hope seemed to be coming to fruition. This thing they had hoped for was becoming real. But all throughout the gospel, Jesus seems to be taking his time. He doesn't mount an attack on Rome. He doesn't lay out a blueprint for the reconstruction of the kingdom of Israel. There's no armory, not even a sharpened stick to poke someone in the eye with. Nothing. In fact, for most of Matthew's gospel, Jesus only seems to hint at the coming kingdom and always with some roundabout ethereal illusions. If he is the hope for Israel, if he's the hope they'd been waiting for, you can imagine folks were following him around saying, when's it going to get started? When's it going to start paying dividends? And that, I think, is where Jesus' words in this section of Matthew's Gospel come into play. Odd words I know after we sing jingle bells and joy to the world, to one will be there, two will be grinding wheat, one will be taken, one will be left. Doesn't sound, I don't think there are any carols written about that. But they're words preparation words about hope. In the 24th chapter of Matthew's Gospel, Jesus begins to really lay this whole end of the age stuff on real thick. And in verses 3 through 8 of what we've read, he talks about these false messiahs, about nations rising up against nations. And now, now we seem to be getting on with this stuff Israel's been hoping for from a messiah. And so in verses 9 through 28 of that same chapter that we've read, Jesus speaks of these coming persecutions, the desecration of the temple by a desolating sacrilege. And just before the verses we've read this morning, he speaks some of the most hopeful words. Words of, about his day, this day that could come, that have, about such an obvious Messiah. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Man, doesn't that, that sounds good. That sounds like what you want to hear. This day that's coming when he'll come on clouds and he'll gather his folks together. 
The Son of Man, obviously in Matthew's Gospel, Jesus is going to send his angels to gather all us good, nice Christian folks up and together. He even goes on to tell us we'll be able to discern the signs when all this is going to go down. Just look at the fig tree, he says. As soon as its branches become tender and put forth leaves, you know the summer is near. There you have it. All that Israel, all that humankind has been waiting for is about to bust loose all over creation. Jesus says, just look for the signs. What sign? You can find a sign right now. Just, just open your phone, type in signs of end times. You'll find some news articles, I'm sure. They're all over. But then we get into our passage. What's all this about knowing the time, being like the folks in Noah's day, one being taken, one being left, being watchful and ready in the passage that we've read this morning? Is this the other edge of the sword called hope? I mean, we all tend to like Jesus and his end time predictions up to this point. but We really get nervous. I get nervous when I read the Gospels and Jesus essentially says, I don't know. I don't know. He does. In fact, some of the later Greek manuscripts of Matthew, the, the, the redactors left out the phrase, nor the son. Do you know why? They don't like this idea that Jesus doesn't know stuff. That Jesus doesn't know. Because we want Jesus to know. We want Jesus to know everything. We want to know everything. We want to know when it's all going to down, go down. We want to know when the end is coming, when our hopes will be realized and fulfilled. And that's the trouble with the keen edge of hope. It's not enough for us to only rely on the words from Jesus. Especially if He says He doesn't know. It's not enough for us. We want something more. Yeah, and it's not a, Jesus doesn't know. No, no, we got to know more. So we got to start filling in the blanks. It's too difficult to be satisfied when we hear words of technical uncertainty. Words that seem to confuse us more than they assure us. That's where Israel was prior to the first century. They had the words of the prophets. They had the teachings of the rabbis. They knew the prophecies. They knew the myths about coming messiahs. But it wasn't enough. They were too vague. Too much room left for interpretation and confusion. So what did they do? They went went and started finding their own. From that gaping hole left by the biting blade of hope, they formed their own conclusions as to what the Messiah would be, what the Messiah could do, what the Messiah would do for them. And the Messiah went from God's chosen to lead His people back into the kingdom to well, what every other powerful person in the world looked like. A king with a sword on a horse. And most of them, most of them, maybe all of them, Missed them all together. But you and I, we stand on the other side of history. We see the great cut made by hope, and yet we hear these words of Jesus, and we want to toss around the possibility of allegory and interpretation. We, we want to come up with well, what it means. What is Jesus talking about? We want to exhaust our mind in trying to figure out when, where, and how the world will end, how this will all come about. Because hope... Hope doesn't seem to be enough for us anymore. We're creatures of details and specifics. We want to know so we can begin to make plans. We don't want to have hope anymore. We want to have certainty. Because hope is a double-edged sword. And it's razor sharp. We want the inside scoop because hope just leaves us too far in what seems like the dark. Hope means we have to put one foot in front of another not knowing where we're going. And friends, we want to know where we're going. We want the little screen on the car to tell us step by step. Maybe the Father chose to conceal this information from even Christ in the Gospel. So there'd be no way we could get away with procrastination. Because I don't know about you, but me, if I know when something's due... When I have to get something done, do you know when I do it? As late as possible. I don't do it right now. I have a thesis to write by February. You think it's written? <laughs> no. No. We are a notoriously procrastinating species. And so whatever the case may be, there's still these hopeful words from Jesus. Keep awake, therefore. 
for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. Yes, Jesus did say he didn't know the day or the hour when the Son of Man will come, but what he did say was that the Lord is coming, that the Son of Man is indeed on his way, and we have hope. And hope is a double-edged sword. And while most of us may hear these words from Jesus as words that give us joy in the coming of the Lord and a call to immediate action for the cause of the kingdom, there may be those who are frozen in our tracks because of their hope in the coming of Christ. Petrified, simply waiting for time to wind down so that they may be taken up. Cut by the other side of hope. The hope that comes in these words from Jesus is found in knowing that Christ calls us to be about the work of God's kingdom now. While we have hope. That hope isn't something you just put in a jar and put on a shelf and say, one day I'll get it down. That hope is what we do now. Hope is what gives us energy now. Not certainty, not having it all figured out, but having hope. That one day Christ is indeed coming. And so Christ's words to Israel in Matthew's gospel are Christ's words to us today. To be ready. We know when the cradle comes. We know when the cross comes. We know when resurrection comes. But we only have hope for when the Lord returns. Hope in what it looks like. Hope in when it will be. But we have hope that it will be. And that hope calls us here and now, to be ready about the work to which Christ calls us all. So in this Advent season, as we light a candle of hope, as we light the other candles, as we sing more carols, don't let it just be about this season. Let it be about the hope that Christ has put in all of us each and every day that calls us each and every day to do his work and be ready. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus Christ, the coming Son of God, giver of all good things. Or as we have gathered for worship, as we have or decorated our sanctuary, as we've come into this place to sing songs to you. So we've now heard a word from Scripture. Give us hope, God. Hope that calls us forward, not hope that leaves us stuck. It calls us on. Hope that comes from you. To look forward to the day, the day we know is coming. We may not know when, we may not know how, but we know it's coming. So, Lord, give us the hope that calls us on with anticipation and joy to that day, even here, even now. Move among us, Holy Spirit, we pray in Christ's name. Amen.